Podcasting from the base of Lake Tahoe in the eastern Sierras comes the Medicine Wheel. We are a group of progressive physicians seeking solutions and enlightenment while surfing the seas of big data and summiting mountains of research in an effort to make the practice of medicine more personal and medical knowledge more accessible and empower you, the listener, to be as healthy as possible. Now, The Medicine Wheel. Welcome to The Medicine Wheel. I'd like to thank all of our listeners again for joining us here today on what we consider to be Podcast Zero. It's our first endeavor into this arena, and I'm happy to have sitting next to me uh, a friend and colleague, uh, someone I've known for over 20 years now, uh, who's practiced medicine for about as long as I've been alive, if not longer, uh, a phenomenal fellow. Again, I'm Dr. Sean Devlin, and next to me is Dr. Michael Gerber, and I'm going to chat with him a little bit uh, about his life in medicine and where he sees things going in the world of medicine in an effort to educate our listening audience on who this gentleman is. I'm proud to have him as a co-founder and a co-host of this show, and it's a thrill to have you here, Michael. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Devlin. Hey, so tell us a little bit about yourself and how you ended up in the field of medicine. Uh, It sounds like a bit of an esoteric journey, and uh, where you ended up uh, after all that is uh, certainly a tale to be told. Well, thank you. On reflecting about that journey, um, I have to go back to the 1960s and uh, the student riots and revolution around the Vietnam War, and my great fortune to have gotten into med school about that time and uh, in that spirit the we had a student uh, activism group there at uh, Kansas University School of Medicine and I was president of the student association and uh, got appointed to the uh, education committee uh, of the student member with all the heads of the department of the various uh, chairs of medicine and surgery uh, at the medical school and got to enjoy all the bickering and fighting over financing and uh, space. And uh, so it was quite eye-opening for a a young medical student to uh, hear the inner workings of the faculty. But during that time, I also got to hear about all the good trips that the medical students could take. And so I was fortunate to be able to spend a summer doing surgery in the Congo, it was Zaire at the time, in watching the murderous machinations of President Dictator Mobutu at that time and a military government. And that's, again, quite eye-opening. And the state of medicine at that time uh, in the Congo was very primitive and very shocking. So that was very eye-opening for me. Also at that time, I got to take over as the editor of the medical student newspaper, which I renamed the Bilious Bustard. So I thought med students at that time were a little bilious, full of bile. And a bustard was an extinct land-waiting bird from England, and I thought that sounded somewhat like the perils uh, facing medical students at the time. I had all the department, many of the department chairmen wrote columns for me, and I had a classmate who was an excellent cartoonist and could do uh, cartoons of all of the heads of the departments. So, again, I had access to a lot of very interesting interviews and a lot of very good times uh, editing and editorializing uh, at the student newspaper. Also, at that time, I heard of a trip as an extern to the Stockton State Mental Hospital in Stockton, California, and that was, I believe, 1969. And uh, this was a state mental hospital, and uh, I got to go through many different uh, parts of the institution and got to see a ward where there were uh, about 40 prefrontally lobotomized females with an average hospitalization of about 35 years. And it was an M&M economy, and if you walked through the door of the ward and uh, the ladies didn't jump up on the flower pot, pull their skirts over their head and urinate, they got a, a, a M&M. I also got to see uh, 
a another behavioral modification ward of teenagers and if the teenager acted out they were put in a black closed box with a door locked behind them and there was a bar they could press and if they pressed 500 times the light would come on another 500 presses and the music came on and another 500 presses and the door would open so that was also a eye-opening and during that time I saw many fascinating things but I also saw electroshock therapy performed without any anesthesia or muscle relaxants and uh, so I recall uh, one of the patients had been sitting on the floor and hadn't eaten in several days and the nursing staff walked up and put the electrodes on his forehead and put him into the full grand mall and again uh, as a uh, young medical student, I was quite shocked. So some of the uh, eye-opening revelations of back in the 60s. So that started me my quest to look at other types of medicine. And uh, when I was in Palo Alto doing pharmacology research, spent some time with an Ayurvedic physician from India and learned about Ayurveda and in how other medical cultures, they have classifications where we didn't have classifications. And so we learned about all the qualities of Ayurveda, the Indian folk medicine, and more about meditation and yoga at the time. Got to learn homeopathy from famous homeopath uh, in Mill Valley, California, and was blessed to meet and study with Dr. Linus Pauling who's a two-time Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he was from Caltech at the time. And his first Nobel Prize was for the nature of the chemical bond. And the second one, individual Nobel, was for his help in abolishing above-ground nuclear testing. So, but he at the time was famous for being Mr. Dr. Vitamin C. And in 1968, he coined the term orthomolecular, which means correct medicine or the right molecules in the right place at the right time, as his wife was fond of saying. So he started in with another friend of mine, the Orthomolecular Medical Society in uh, 1975 or six, and I think I was president of that group in 1983, and was privileged to be able to take care of Dr. Pauling for a number of years. So this was eye-opening to be able to be exposed to the pioneers in nutritional medicine. And then not long after that, I joined the Chelation Society. And Chelation comes from the Greek word kilos, the claw, to grasp or bind, the crab's claw. It was all about pulling out heavy metals out of people and also lead, cadmium, arsenic, aluminum, tin, nickel, titanium and also about pulling calcium out of arteries. So it was uh, widely used at that time and more widely scientifically based now for hardening of the arteries for arteriosclerosis. So this was uh, also a very eye-opening experience in using intravenous nutrients and chelation agents uh, in the treatment of uh, illness and in extending lifespan. So along about this time, uh, we also learned about various uh, varieties of uh, body work and massage and physical therapy. And so we began to uh, have a broadened sense of treatment for the patients. So along those lines uh, is where I started working in for many years. Now I've been in Reno, Nevada for 35 years and doing electroacupuncture, which is diagnosis with the aid of a computer. And we have all of classical homeopathy in the computer, all heavy metals, many bugs and viruses and bacteria and heavy metals and chemicals. And we can assess a person's response uh, to, or a patient's response to all of these substances. So it gives us quite a, a breadth of uh, 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 treatment and in utilizing all the nutrients and the vitamins and the healthful aging substances and working at trying to get rid of uh, old family tree uh, problems that uh, manifest in people's psyche a lot and also helping with everyday occurrences of stress and grief 
and of course working with hormonal disbalance and working with bioidentical hormones. And bioidentical hormones uh, uh, was very, uh, which we have worked with since 1975, uh, especially in support of the adrenal gland. And the adrenal gland is a little gland on top of the kidneys. And in Chinese medicine, uh, all qi, which is all energy, comes from the kidney. But they really mean kidney adrenal. And this was really reinforced in me in my year's study of the UCLA Medical Acupuncture Training Course, which I graduated from year's course in 1997. So it was very useful to learn all of these points. During this time, I was fortunate to study with uh, Dietrich Klinghardt, MD, PhD, and learning neural therapy. And neural therapy is an old German tradition, dates back to 1906, when Einhorn discovered procaine, a local anesthetic. But it's not like all the other anesthetics. It's actually a B vitamin and a precursor of choline, and it makes nerves wake up that have been injured or damaged. And the nerves sit on top of capillaries, so if the nerves damage, the capillary is not providing blood flow to the area. So by doing neural therapy, which are usually injections of procaine, which we usually fortify with complex homeopathic remedies from Heal Company in Baden-Baden, Germany, largest manufacturer of homeopathics in the world. And then we can place these into acupuncture points and it's remarkably uh, relieving of pain, uh, immediate relief of most headaches, of even uh, kidney stones, uh, gallbladder uh, pain, uh, sinus pain, teeth pain, shoulder, knees, backs, elbows, lumbar spine, sciatica. So it's an immediate uh, means of pain relief. And again, it's a wonderful addition to our armamentarium which that we've learned over the years. So this has been all these revelations, you know, over the years have brought us to this point uh, where we can uh, help uh, a lot of chronically ill people. Now we see the breadth of patients from uh, babies to old age and uh, there are wonderful German remedies that have been, they're called isopathic remedies, they're made from bacteria and fungi that have been uh, homeopathically diluted, that are wonderful to treat children and also for every condition in adults. So again, it's another very broad spectrum of treatment that we have available. And of course, uh, not to downplay regular allopathy, and that allopathy is your regular medical school training of drugs and surgery and psychiatry and uh, all of the specialties in medicine, which are all tremendously important and have a great place. And with that uh, being said, uh, we uh, firmly believe that people don't become ill because of lack of drugs or medicine. It's their lifestyle, their heredity, uh, lack of nutrients, uh, poisoning from the environment, there are, you know, tens of thousands of chemicals in our environment, in our food and water that weren't there uh, 80, 100 years ago. <clears throat> so uh, removing uh, the detoxifying these chemicals, which can hang up in our liver because our liver is the oil filter for the car and the kidneys and in our connective tissue. So detoxing these uh, out of our body is extremely important. And besides chelation, which pulls out heavy metals, uh, one of the ways to pull out chemicals out of the body is by routine sweating. And we have uh, a men and women spa in our clinic that uses far infrared sauna. Now, far infrared sauna is high tech, low temperature sauna that heats us from the inside out. And it works from 90 to 140 degrees while regular saunas or 140 to 220 degrees. So it's much easier on people and they sweat out their toxins uh, gradually over a period of uh, weeks and months. Usually these are helped to be sopped up in the body by great antioxidants and we have wonderful glutathione, 
that's very well absorbed in other precursors of glutathione and vitamin C. So this helps to uh, eliminate poisons and toxins from the body. So there are a lot of levels uh, that we can work with uh, with our patients over a period of time. And uh, part of the art of medicine is deciding where to go first. And most frequently, uh, we do bioidentical hormones. Again, we are wonderfully uh, 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 staffed and have much help in our clinic uh, to do a lot of intravenous and intramuscular injections of hormones, especially adrenal support. We do all the bioidenticals of uh, testosterone and estriol, the safest of all the estrogens with a little estradiol. Progesterone is absolutely miraculous. And again, these are bioidentical. These are not drugs. These are, it's not Provera, medroxyprogesterone, acetate, or norethendrone that's in birth control pills. These are bioidentical hormones. And progesterone, besides being a, uh, an important uh, hormone, it's not feminizing. And I've just learned this five or six years ago, and it can be used by uh, little kids and uh, by men, and it has a very calming effect. It blocks adrenaline, and it enhances GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, our downer neurotransmitter, one of them. So if a patient walks in, and, uh, um, and I always like to do Chinese pulses, and uh, if the pulse is tick, 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 ticking away, I said, geez, are you, uh, do you have anxiety? And the patient may say, well, yes, I am. And I always say on a zero to 10, how bad is it? He says, oh, it's a nine or a 10. It's terrible. So we rub a little progesterone on the forearms of the patient. And within five minutes, the anxiety will drop in half or may disappear altogether. And that's so exciting. So it's wonderful for sleeping. It's wonderful for ADD kids before school because these kids are all running on adrenaline. And adrenaline is made in the middle of the adrenal gland. So we're trying to support the outside of the adrenal gland, the cortex. And progesterone is very high in the pathways of manufacturing adrenal cortical hormones. So it supports uh, sleep and it's anti-anxiety. And it's wonderful for eliminating PMS, premenstrual syndrome, and painful periods and irregular periods. And it heals the uterus. So it's great for problems with infertility and ovarian cysts and leiomyomas, fibroid tumors of the uterus, and all those other fun girl things, including uh, breast fibrous tissue in the breast and helping to prevent uh, breast cancer. And speaking of breast cancer, uh, vitamin D uh, is so dreadfully important for breast cancer. People that have high levels of vitamin D, especially, I mean, women with high levels of vitamin D have a 70% reduction in the incidence of breast cancer. So we feel it very important to measure blood levels of vitamin D and make sure everyone is adequately supplemented. Just uh, uh, having exposure to sunlight is very good if you live in the tropics or southern Florida, but in Reno in the winter, it's a little impractical. So we think supplementing vitamin D is dread uh, dreadfully important for everybody, and it really helps to prevent cancer and uh, autoimmune diseases, as well as improve the mood. So there are so many wonderful tools that we have learned over the years and try to integrate them appropriately into each patient's uh, treatment. That is phenomenal. Uh, you have just described uh, the road less traveled uh, by many clinicians. Uh, an amazing uh, information that you just shared with us. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I want to move on to talk about lessons in medicine. So you've had quite a bit of time out there in the trenches doing uh, medical practice. Talk to me about any uh, profound lessons that you have learned uh, along the way. Well, as all the famous physicians since antiquity have said, listen to the patient and they will tell you what is the problem. And I think that that is so terribly important is to uh, bring one's intuitive level into understanding what patients are telling you directly or indirectly <clears throat> and things they're not telling you. 
So I think that is probably the most important lesson is to plug into the patient. And I also uh, am such a big fan of employing Chinese pulses. Any kind of taking the pulse at the wrist is important because you get immediate biofeedback on what's going on with that person's metabolism and, of course, their heart rhythm. And as I've always, I write a fair amount. I'm a columnist for the Townsend Letter, which is a national alternative medicine magazine. I've been a a columnist for Alternative Medicine Magazine for many years, and for the last 12 or 13 years, I've been a columnist for Healthy Beginnings in Northern Nevada and California. So I've had the opportunity to write a lot about all of these uh, uh, issues. But most importantly, I think, again, listening to the patient, being very present in the room, uh, getting some biofeedback from the patient by pulse, and of course, with the electroacupuncture by Vol, V O L L, who's the doctor that first uh, uh, integrated this therapy in the early 1940s in Germany. And German docs have been using these kinds of machines for 80 years, and I've been at it at least 20 or 25 years. So, again, we can get immediate feedback from the patient about what's going on with them energetically. So I think this uh, feedback from the patient is probably the most important thing uh, that we can do is to be sensitive to patients' needs and listen to their uh, life stresses. And whether it's death of loved ones or animals, uh, grieving is huge. Uh, There have been, and many patients have been greatly abused from childhood, either physically, emotionally, sexually, abused or abused by medicine. Um, Many, I think another profound discovery uh, early on is that many medicines uh, do have side effects and or direct effects and that a lot of patients who are sensitive or allergic to multiple chemical sensitivities don't do well with many medications which is why doing homeopathics and nutrients and vitamins and amino acids and enzymatic therapy uh, is much more effective for these people. They just can't take drugs. Other people can take 14 or 16 drugs and they're just fine, but some people can't do it. So uh, that is important for us to listen to and this is part of our uh, uh, patient population are people who have been to 14 or 22 doctors and keep trying different drug regimens and find that they have too many side effects, they don't do well, and have become very discouraged with allopathic only. Now, once again, allopathy is life and death for uh, certain situations. And we love our surgeons and all urologists and gynecologists and uh, all the medical specialists, and we use a lot of radiology, uh, you know, for diagnosis. So it's very important to have all of these tools available for the, uh, the patient. Uh, so having a breadth of practice, I think, including all of these is very, very important and profound for me. And also that uh, uh, it's still very, very patient-centered. Fantastic. I mean, those are some awesome uh, pieces of wisdom. Uh, moving on, I kind of want to step outside of medicine a little bit and learn uh, more about what you really have a passion for above and beyond the practice of medicine. It's obvious that you do have a very strong passion for the practice of medicine, but what else in your life? Obviously, uh, you have a beautiful family. Um, you've been living here for quite some time. What else um, are you entrenched in as far as uh, a passion goes? Well, Sean, as you know, I've been a musician all my life. And from back in the 60s with traveling bands in the Midwest doing R&B, James Brown, off the record, uh, back in the 60s, and I was in bands all the way through uh, high school and college. And then uh, I was a music major and did a lot of uh, actually composing and arranging for traveling groups from KU. And then subsequently, in later years, uh, I started singing with the Nevada Opera in about 1984 and sang with the opera for about 30 years until their demise with the Great Recession. Mm-hmm. And now I'm singing in the chorus with the Philharmonic, and we're about to do 
the uh, Mozart Requiem on April 27th of the 19th, so we invite everybody to come out and see that. It'll be fun. And so uh, singing has always, uh, lately has been my musical passion, but I still uh, play electric bass sometimes, and I play guitar, so uh, I like to uh, keep up my musical chops. That's awesome. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about what your personal best medicine is. How do you care for yourself? Well, being exposed to the healthful literature and going to the A4M for 20 years, the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, and I'm a diplomat in uh, one of those uh, uh, organizations. So we've learned uh, for many years about healthful aging products especially things like human growth hormone, which goes downhill as we age, all the bioidentical hormones, testosterone, uh, which uh, uh, reduces one's incidence of heart attacks and strokes 50% and all mortality 50% uh, is wonderful for men and, of course, girl-sized testosterone for ladies, uh, especially those with uh, no libido, no sex drive. Uh, the girl size is very good. So uh, that has always been of interest. Uh, thyroid in and of itself is, uh, you can write books and chapters about thyroid. Uh, th we have so many anti-thyroid substances in our world uh, that impair the thyroid gland from radiation to soy products to egg whites to beans and broccoli and Brussels sprouts. And of course, the big devil is fluoride. Fluoride in toothpaste and in the water is very anti-thyroid. And when your thyroid is low, it can increase your risk of cancer and hardening of the arteries, and most specifically mood and depression and weight gain. And uh, the appearance of low thyroid is called myxedema, which is a proteinaceous swelling. And you can see it on people's faces. They're puffy, they have great depth of lines. Uh, on their forehead, their eyelids sag down, and and they're usually are very sensitive to the cold, and these uh, the and the blood tests uh, for a number of reasons are not always very sensitive to who can use some thyroid. So we uh, uh, Dr. Broda Barnes, M.D. Ph.D. out of Fort Collins, Colorado, in 1975, wrote a book called Hypothyroidism: The Unsuspected Illness. And he started uh, reviving the old ways of measuring thyroid, which is basal temperatures. So you can take the underarm temperature first thing in the morning, and it should be 98. But if it's 97, 96, 95, if it's too cold, that is a good measurement of low thyroid. So by giving the thyroid, Dr. Barnes did a study you know, that he put out in his first book, a 20-year study of 1,569 patients who were on thyroid, and he noted their incidence of heart attacks, then measured those incidents against the Framingham study, which is a study of, that everybody uses as a baseline for cardiovascular statistics from a little town in Massachusetts, Framingham. So according to the Framingham study, over 20 years and 1,569 patients, he should have had 71 heart attacks. Only four occurred. So thyroid and having the metabolism, thyroid is the accelerator pedal of our car. It turns up all of our energy manufacturing, and many people are low from exposure to chemicals and fluoride. Chlorine in the water supply also blocks thyroid. So there are many thyroid blockers, and restoring thyroids to a healthy level is a great life extender. So supporting the adrenal gland, uh, making sure that sleep is uh, very uh, adequate. And again, uh, understanding how to use supplements, especially magnesium. Magnesium is Mother Nature's relaxer. It's also a laxative. And taking magnesium, I especially like magnesium glycinate, which is a chelator bound to glycine, the smallest of the amino acids. And it's very relaxing and calming. Magnesium before bed is marvelous to help people asleep, as is progesterone. Now, there are other kinds of GABA and 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan, the precursor of serotonin and melatonin, not to mention melatonin straight out, which is high at night and excellent for sleeping. So, 
for longevity, adequate sleep is important, and these sleeping uh, products, and especially all the herbs that are wonderful for sleeping, vervain, valerian, hops, mugwort, St. John's wort, all of these herbs are marvelous for sleeping. So good sleep, uh, keeping your arteries cleaned out with chelation therapy, which I've done for all these 40 three years doing intravenous chelation and you can do oral chelation as well to pull the calcium out of the arteries and the heavy metals out of our body that we're all exposed to. Uh, Vitamin D again so important. Vitamin C is incredibly important. Uh, We are all in a state of subclinical scurvy and you know scurvy uh, was famous made famous in the seafaring days um uh, when the sailors would uh, go out on the ocean and not have uh, fresh vegetables, and they'd all get scurvy, and it starts out uh, the disease going a little crazy, and then the joints start going bad, and the teeth start falling out, and the sailors would get weak and couldn't stand their watches. So a physician called Edward Lind, back in the early 1700s, uh, mid 1700s, found that if you gave the sailors one lime per day that they wouldn't get scurvy. And that's still not a lot of vitamin C. But uh, so that hence English sailors are you know, still called limeys. And that uh, the lime business wasn't put in by the Admiralty for 60 years after Lind uh, discovered the effect of vitamin C on the sailors. So people have uh, all, especially in northern uh, hemispheres, northern climes, have all started having surge, uh, a scurvy by spring when they ran out of fresh fruits and vegetables. So man does not make vitamin C uh, in his liver like all of the other animals except primates and guinea pigs and fruit bats. And man, nobody, everybody else makes vitamin C from glucose in their liver and we don't do it. Now as far as longevity is concerned, vitamin C is uh, important for all of our connective tissue and our coronary arteries are made with elastin which is the elastic tissue that is very uh, necessary for a high pressure pump like the heart so if you don't have enough vitamin c the elastin doesn't get produced and the coronaries start breaking down and the body starts pumping plaque into the coronaries to plug up the holes in the dike So just by taking vitamin C, your connective tissue is going to be much better. Um, I like to remind us of the story of the person skiing out in the ski run and hit a few ripples of ice on the way out, falls down on their shoulder, and uh, the person who's adequate in vitamin C gets up, shakes themselves off, and goes right down the run. The other person may have shattered their entire shoulder and their collarbone, Uh, because of not enough vitamin C. Same thing of the ligaments of the spine. All the vertebrae are held together with ligaments in those vitamin C. If you don't have enough, the ligaments get loose and lax and the the vertebrae start squeezing down on the nerves coming out of the back. And there's a chronic back pain that many, many people have and sciatica pain going down the legs. So by having adequate vitamin C, and we just have to remember that the goat that weighs 150 pounds makes 14,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day, and we don't make any. And the goat makes more than that when they're under stress. So by taking adequate amounts of vitamin C, and usually uh, vitamin C, like magnesium, is an osmotic laxative. So people say, well, I live in Nevada in the high dry, and you know, I have a bowel movement maybe once a week, Uh, or longer, twice a week, by taking vitamin C and magnesium, you can turn that right up to two bowel movements a day. So one can adjust vitamin C and magnesium doses up until the bowel is slightly loose, and then you pull back a little bit. So taking the C's and the magnesium, and we really like vitamin K2. Uh, K2, along with D3, takes calcium out of the soft tissue and puts it in the bones. And I just learned a couple of years back that vitamin K takes calcium and puts it into teeth to prevent cavities. Never knew that. So the kids that have a lot of recurrent uh, cavities need their vitamin K. In nature, vitamin K is found in butter. So you want your good organic butter. And of course, never, never, ever use margarine, 
which is a trans fat and really bollocks up our cell membranes and is very pro-inflammatory. So only butter and organic uh, oils, vegetable oils. Uh, boron is another wonderful thing we have learned about uh, over the years. And uh, boron, and we take an organic form of food-grade borax in very diluted doses to open up all of our cell membranes. Again, it also uh, protects against electromagnetic fields. It's very good to treat and prevent arthritis. So um, it is good for our higher spiritual selves. So it does many, many factors and it helps to prevent and treat osteoporosis and holy bones. So being aware of all these vitamins and minerals and trace minerals and taking them, and I, I'm very religious about it, uh, is incredibly important, I think, for longevity and, of course, for maintaining our brain. And uh, as, as we all know, their nursing homes are full of people with bodies that look perfectly normal and no brain and no memory and Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. So you can help to prevent it by taking many uh, brain-friendly nutrients such as acetyl L-carnitine, which, which manufactures phosphatidylcholine, which is our neurotransmitter for memory. We like cytidine 5-diphosphocholine, which does the same thing. Glycerol phosphocholine does the same thing. Uh, uh, phosphatidylserine does the same thing. And other herbs that are known to promote uh, healthy memory. Uh, and as far as stress reduction, there are so many vitamins and, and that are great for longevity, especially uh, cordyceps and ashwagandha from India and uh, N-acetylcysteine um, and uh, ginseng, so many things that are helpful that are adaptogens that keep us able to uh, stand in there with life stresses and still have a happy, uh, upbeat mood. So taking all these things, I think, has been uh, a good lesson for me. And as you have aptly said, we've been in the trenches for a long time. And uh, it's important that we, you know, uh, do the role that we tell our patients about and eat healthy foods and as much organic food as you can and avoiding uh, GMO foods. And as you know, GMO means genetically modified organisms. And the reason they're modified is so they can stand huge levels of herbicides, namely glyphosate, which is Roundup. So commercial corn has 14 to 16 times more Roundup in it than organic corn. And it really helps to destroy our bacterial flora in our gut and secondarily our immune system. So all commercial corn, all commercial soy, all canola oil, and, they're, and it's becoming more and more frequent as uh, farmers and ranchers are finishing off their grains with glyphosate so they can harvest them earlier without them uh, go, spoiling and going bad. So again, eating you know organic foods for longevity is terribly important. And people uh, you know drink, drinking soda or diet soda, oh my gosh. Um, regular soda has high fructose corn syrup, and that's all made with GMO corn. And high fructose corn syrup, part of the process, also involves mercury. And when we haven't even got into uh, uh, biological dentistry, uh, in biological dentistry, we have learned over the years, in the last 40, 50 years, that silver fillings are actually 50% mercury. And every time you have a bite of hot food or hot drink hot liquid, that mercury comes off into the saliva and the breath. And mercury is a powerful neurotoxin and can cause <clears throat> been related to MS and uh, many other neurological diseases. There are a lot of people that don't support the use of root canals. German biological dentistry uh, has a very uh, uh, funky moniker for root canals. They call them a corpse in the attic. Uh, if they're not completely properly done, uh, the, the little dental canals are not all filled properly and bacteria can storm right in there and create chronic dental infections. And these infections can cause sticky blood and also some of the bacterial byproducts uh, can cause cancer and are spe specifically related to breast cancer. 
in German biological dentistry, the teeth are all related to distant organs and hormones and joints and parts of our body. And there are eight teeth in the mouth that are related to the breast. So uh, this is another important concept to be aware of that your teeth can kill you. And we see the people uh, that are chronically ill and have you know joint symptoms, brain symptoms, bipolar symptoms, insomnia symptoms, and have been worked up by their local docs and their lab work is totally normal, their physical exam is totally normal, all their x-rays and radiology is totally normal, but their dental situation is an absolute mess. So uh, we can rescue a lot of the chronically ill people by cleaning up the dentition. And uh, so all these uh, are factors uh, to promote uh, longevity and good health. Wow. Well, that was uh, extremely comprehensive. So thank you uh, for sharing that. Um, I kind of want to talk a little bit about sort of uh, the 30,000 foot view of healthcare today. In your opinion, what are we doing right in healthcare? Well, um, people are becoming more and more aware of their environment that you should eat as purely as you can. And I think this is uh, from Whole Foods to natural grocers to Trader Joe's, uh, there are, you know, and far, farm to restaurant uh, foods and the co-op here in town are bringing us, you know, organic veggies. And more and more people are uh, turning their food dollars into organic uh, produce and products. And I think that's absolutely marvelous. People are starting to get the idea that you have to take care of your health and what goes into you if it's toxic is to be accumulative. So I think that is one of the very best things. More and more doctors are learning about integrative medicine, functional medicine, orthomolecular medicine. I wish more would learn homeopathy, but it, homeopathy is uh, uh, quite a skill. I always say it's good to know an older homeopath <laughs> because uh, there are uh, thousands of remedies and learning how to use them properly is uh, quite an art form and a great long study. So keeping that together now, uh, there's all of our chiropractic brethren, all of our people doing body work, all of our people doing cranial sacral therapy and massage therapy uh, are all helping us uh, with our stress and our musculoskeletal pain. And so this seems to be broadening out as well. Uh, our allopathic brethren and uh, more and more are coming to say, oh, gee, that, that really worked. And now I can add this in. So it's important to be able to do the least toxic therapy uh, possible when dealing with people. And sometimes the antibiotic or the, ke the chemotherapy, the radiation therapy, uh, extensive surgery, all these are absolutely necessary under some circumstances, but again, prevention is the name of the game, and that's your daily lifestyle, your supplementation, and I think more and more uh, consumers are getting the idea that they have to take care of their health so they don't fall into the hands of docs who only know, uh, only know uh, drug therapy. And uh, it's not that it, drug therapy is not absolutely needed in cardiovascular disease and hypertension. And there are psychiatric issues that are absolutely needed to be treated by drugs. But many of these things can be treated by amino acids, especially in psychiatry. Uh, amino acids are the precursors of neurotransmitters. And those are our brain chemicals that make us happy and calm and awake and alert and sleep. And these can be, are all made out of tryptophan, which goes through 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan makes serotonin, and tyrosine, the amino acid, makes dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, the up awake alert neurotransmitters, and they should always be taken uh, together. They're a balance. So uh, people's moods and energy can be maintained and balanced by these guys. Also, in the realm of psychiatry, when you have people who have been pillars of the community, uh, teachers, doctors, lawyers, uh, accountants, the pillars of the community, and all of a sudden they're breaking down and having anxiety attacks and uh, horrible depressions and insomnias, again, these can be infectious disease. So we see a lot of chronic viruses like Epstein-Barr virus, 
And when you have a virus running through you, not only can it kill your energy, but it really insults the adrenal gland. And if the adrenal gland is insulted, it doesn't store blood sugar in your liver. And if you don't have blood sugar in your liver and you run out of blood sugar, your brain thinks that you're going to die and signals down to the adrenaline in the middle of the adrenal gland, which is dumped into the bloodstream and helps the body take fat and convert it into blood sugar. So the blood sugar goes up, people don't die, but here's anxiety and panic and insomnia. So viruses can cause it. Uh, we think that there is an epidemic of Lyme disease and uh, Lyme cofactor disease, and we are seeing more and more uh, 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 parasites uh, coming from people's travels and even parasites that have traveled here that can really insult the system. So finding infectious disease and parasitism uh, in these people who suddenly have uh, psychiatrically l apparently lost it uh, can be due to these other factors that can be dealt with and parasites killed and viruses that can be neutralized. So uh, it's a bigger perspective on psychiatry and uh, important especially for people who uh, are acutely ill and there doesn't seem to be any great reason for it. Again, amazing, Dr. Gerber. I, I want to see the flip side of this question. Uh, what can be done to improve health care, in your opinion? That's a good question, and I think the medicine wheel that we are sitting in the middle of today is certainly a part of our attempt to broaden the awareness of the various types of medical uh, intervention that can be brought. And as I think of medicine wheel, I haven't really mentioned herbology. And of course, Chinese have been into herbology for thousands of years, and in Ayurveda, 10,000 years, and the American Indians for thousands of years. So there are many herbs that generally have less side effects than drugs that can be employed for almost, employed for almost any uh, illness situation in the body. And uh, again, herbology is something that people are becoming more and more aware of. And you can find these herbs at any of our health food stores. Uh, so I think people are uh, getting, again, getting more and more uh, aware of this. And this will help people with uh, maintaining their own health and learning their herbs and their, their nutrients. So hopefully there's a growing awareness among doctors. Uh, more doctors are practicing so-called functional medicine, which is kind of a conglomerate of uh, integrative and orthomolecular and alternative. We don't like alternative because alternative means one or the other, and we are integrative. We like everybody's uh, knowledge. It's just a pro uh, using it, applying it appropriately uh, is so important. So more and more docs are getting into this. Uh, at the A4M, which is the Anti-Aging Medicine Convention, every December, in Las Vegas at the Venetian, there'll be four to 5,000 doctors, a huge room, and everybody trying to uh, update their skills and knowledge in anti-aging and nutritional uh, medicine and bringing in speakers from around the world uh, that have been teaching uh, all of these uh, skills. So I'm, in har I'm heartened by seeing more and more doctors learning this. The chelation groups are still going very strongly. The uh, biological dentistry group, the IABDM, the International Academy of Biological Dentistry and Medicine, and the IAOMP, the International Oral Medicine and Toxicology group. Uh, these guys have been teaching uh, uh, the biological dentistry for 30, 40 years. And these groups are growing in an influence, and there are more and more young dentists that are understanding biological uh, dentistry. And uh, if you take out a tooth, you should be putting PRP in there, platelet-rich protein, and that's where you take some of the patient's blood, spin it, and take off a little uh, pad patty of white blood cells, and you sew that into the hole where the tooth was, first after using ozonated water to kill all the bacteria in the base of that uh, where that pulp of the tooth was then you put the PRP in and then let that uh, mature and it makes really you know really really good bone we haven't even talked about oxidative therapy 
and oxidative therapy have been around over 150 years, as like many of these was developed in Germany. And by using peroxide and ozone, uh, we can stimulate the immune system to fight viruses and bacteria, and they're very helpful in treatment of cancer. So by using uh, oxidative therapy, we even put these next to teeth to kill bacteria uh, in the teeth. And you can even take ozonated olive oil or coconut oil and put it on little cotton swabs next to uh, an infected tooth, and it'll help uh, assuage the infection until uh, proper dental care can be uh, achieved and sought. So oxidative therapy is another huge uh, part of integrative medicine uh, that has been more and more widely uh, uh, accepted. Uh, our friend Dr. Schallenberger in Carson City uh, asked me to speak at his convention a year ago, August, in Las Vegas, and he had people from Africa and from uh, Southeast Asia that were attending. And so it was a very international audience, lots from Germany and Europe. So a very international audience uh, was learning more about oxidative therapy. So I'm very hopeful that these types of therapy will gain traction. And the uh, it's, you know vigilance uh, is always important. Uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, there uh, is, we're trying not to uh, take away market share from big pharma, but it does come down to that uh, somewhat. So that's important to uh, keep big pharma happy as well. It's very insightful. Um, I don't uh, presume you have a crystal ball, but maybe we can do some future casting here and give us an idea based on your past 50 years of experience what the next 25 to 50 years may look like in the field of medicine. Reminds me of an old joke, but I won't get into depends. Hmm. But uh, somebody was asking what kind of underwear uh, some of the presidential candidates were wearing in and one said boxers, and the other one said depends. <laughs> but uh, it depends on uh, our leadership and uh, how we can balance the lobbying of big pharma that would like to, uh, of course, sell more drugs, and or whether big pharma becomes more interested in nutrients and enzymes and bioidentical hormones and hopefully doesn't shut down the business of uh, small mom and pop operations, but if they are uh, become more and more interested in this kind of medicine and find a profit motive in it, then I think that this is uh, going to uh, prosper. Uh, patient demand, public demand, uh, right now is being felt with the uh, very high costs of pharmaceutical drugs, and nobody uh, reigning in those costs. Uh, obviously has gotten the intention, attention of many politicians. Uh, it's, you, you know, it's almost impossible to be a diabetic these days on a working man's salary because of the tripling of the cost of insulin over the last decade. So uh, there are many factors uh, involved, and a lot of them have to do with regulatory agencies. Uh, we hope that there is an expansion of uh, pharmacies that can uh, manufacture bioidentical hormones and specialty uh, medications that are specifically derived for an individual patient compounding pharmacies. And again, uh, they're uh, in competition with regular pharmacies and the regulatory boards uh, may uh, see them in a more favorable light over time. And uh, so that would be a very favorable input for the future of medicine. So we're hopeful that uh, the regulatory scene uh, is kind to this type of medicine and that it can and will expand. Uh, if uh, the reverse is happening uh, and there is a more dictatorial uh, 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 environment for medicine, it may go the other way. So uh, we're just hopeful that the educational process uh, can uh, overwhelm the uh, profit motive for big medicine and big pharma and that uh, the consumer 
uh, will get their desires. Wow. Again, some more wisdom. Thank you. Uh, this last question has to deal with your pearls of medical knowledge, wisdom, advice, things that you can pass on to our listeners today um, that they can uh, take immediately and apply for their health. Well, we like to start with very basic things. And uh, number one, don't use fluoride toothpaste. Don't use fluoride mouthwash. Don't drink fluoridated water. You know, if you're in a state that requires fluoride in the water, uh, Washoe County here doesn't, and we've had many a good battle over this. There's so much uh, negative uh, uh, data about fluoridation, and I won't get into the politics of it. But again, don't do fluoride, anything. It's the aging factor. And there is not one reaction in the human body that requires fluorine. And it just causes brittle bones and brittle teeth and brittle uh, hips. And there's a great increase in bone fractures in the elderly that have been exposed to fluoridated water, for example. And fluoride causes osteoporosis and osteopenia and bone fractures. So one of the biggest pearls I can tell patients is, please avoid fluoride. Now, another uh, basic, I think, that people should understand is to consider what kind of salt they are consuming. Now, regular table salt has aluminum in it because it's a desiccant or a D, uh, an anti-caking agent. And as we have probably have heard that aluminum is related to Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, and high blood pressure. As I mentioned, the nursing homes are full of dementia people and Alzheimer's people, so we know that aluminum is a terrible uh, neurotoxin. And uh, the, I won't mention the name, but the little gal with the, uh, uh, the umbrella uh, on the salt label, it pours in the rain because it's got aluminum in there. So we do suggest Celtic salt from France and real salt from Utah. And there's that pink salt. I won't name the brand. But we are given to understand that the pink stuff, the pink sea salt, is high in fluoride and bromide. And I've just learned recently that it's high in mercury. So again, basic stuff. Uh, what do you brush your teeth with? What kind of salt are you using? Uh, these basic little pearls and... Uh, and people do remember you for these things. Well, I remember you told me about fluoride 30 years ago, you know. So these are, you know, really basic pearls. I do think that if you can't afford much supplementation, that you do the big three, I call them, vitamin C, magnesium, and K2 and D3. And again, D3 protects us against osteoporosis and cancer and infectious disease and depression. Uh, in autoimmune disease. So vitamin C protects us against subclinical scurvy, so all of our connective tissue keeps going. The highest concentration of vitamin C in the human body is in the adrenal cortex. And then that guy is responsible for your blood sugar maintenance. Of course, vitamin C is responsible for the all your connective tissue manufacturing. And people who bruise a lot, or they brush their teeth and the teeth bleed, you know, it's not gum disease. It's a deficiency of vitamin C, mostly. And magnesium, again, there's over 300 different reactions in the human body that depend on uh, on magnesium. And it's very difficult to get enough out of the standard American diet. So I do suggest that everybody take uh, magnesium. Also, I do think screening for thyroid, very, very important. And uh, that this is a, a widespread deficiency uh, that causes uh, high cholesterol. When I was in med school, if somebody had high cholesterol, it was automatically assumed that they had low thyroid. Williams' textbook of endocrinology, 1974. So this is, a lot of it's really old stuff. But a few of these uh, basic pearls, I think, are what people should uh, take away and when you can afford to do more healthful aging things like resveratrol and acetyl L-carnitine and uh, other uh, great herbal things that uh, promote uh, long life. And again, even getting into uh, one of our uh, uh, wonderful educators and uh, scientists and researchers here in Reno, uh, Bill Andrews and Sierra Science, 
and he is the popularizer and studier of the uh, uh, the uh, longevity uh, of mankind, and uh, so he's uh, studies telomeres, and telomeres are the plate which the DNA uh, lines up on, and the DNA, you know, continues to divide and make new tissue for us, but each time that the DNA divides, the telomere gets a little shorter, and when the telomere gets too short, the DNA don't replicate anymore, and we die. So he has found substances to elongate the telomere and uh, in new products that can help us live longer uh, in that in that fashion. So uh, we like to uh, give a nod to longevity and telomeres and Dr. Andrews. So uh, there are many wonderful pearls in health and uh, it's a, a great privilege to uh, uh, be able to speak about them here on Medicine Wheel. Dr. Gerber, thank you again. Uh, you've uh, spent a great bit of time with us here today. I just want to say uh, we appreciate everything you shared with us. I want to thank you personally. Obviously, uh, like always, I am learning something new. And I'd like to thank all of our listeners here at the Medicine Wheel uh, for the time you spend. I uh, hope you guys took good notes today because there was a lot of pearls shed. And uh, we look forward to hearing you, uh, hearing from you soon. And please, uh, if you want to learn more about Dr. Gerber and the work he does, please visit themedicinewheel.org. Again, have a blessed and beautiful day. The Medicine Wheel encourages all of our listeners to subscribe to our newsletter and podcasts as we continue to explore the world of medicine, bringing you up-to-date health and science information. The Medicine Wheel invites our listeners to email us any newsworthy stories or topics they wish to explore further and discuss on the podcast. For more information about the Medicine Wheel, please visit us at our website, www.themedicinewheel.org, and on Facebook, and finally on Twitter and Instagram at The Med Wheel. In an effort to support access to integrative medicine and functional medicine options for those in need and education for those who need information, please consider donating to Project Omcare, 501c3.org. Please go to our website, www.themedicinewheel.org, to learn more. Thank you again to all our local sponsors. Grateful Gardens, Lighthouse Coffee, and Dorinda's Chocolates, which represent some of the best organic and appetizing options in the Reno Tahoe area. Lighthouse Coffee Shop is a proud sponsor of the Medicine Wheel. We are a family owned and operated local coffee shop. Our goal as a business and a family is to cultivate community wherever we are. All of our coffee is ethically sourced, organic, and farm fresh. It's roasted in-house daily, guaranteeing you access to the freshest cup of coffee on the planet. We care deeply for our community and everyone in it. We strive to provide you with the best ingredients and most comfortable environment. Come and enjoy coffee with us. We are family and we would love for you to be part of it. Gerber Medical Clinic is proud to support the Medicine Wheel and medical education to improve health quality, nurturing the lifestyles of our listening community, enhancing wellness for all. Thanks again to Wired Insights and their talented team for making our podcasting dream possible. In closing, we would like to remind all of our listeners, if you have a medical concern or diagnosis, you need to see your personal doctor without delay, and if needed, obtain a referral to a specialist. If ever you feel the health issue you have is urgent or an emergency, please call 911 and go to your nearest emergency room. Please do not take any of our physician's commentary or our guest's opinion as medical advice, and always seek out medical care from fully licensed and appropriately trained medical professionals in your area. The information shared in this podcast is for general information only and should not be construed as medical advice and understand that no doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and educational materials linked to this podcast and website are employed at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not meant to be used as a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. 
This is the Medicine Wheel signing off for this week with a reminder to live, love, listen, and learn.